Hi, Year 13. This lecture is looking at the relationship between social class and crime. This is a unit we won't spend much time on because we have talked about class and crime to quite a lot of uh, quite an extent in the other topics we've looked at when we looked at the theoretical perspectives in crime. So what I'd like to do is read through the summary of this article, um, published uh, in May uh, 2013. And I've given you some questions I'd like you to answer. Five questions. Uh, summarise the events of the article. Uh, what does this tell you about law enforcement? Who are the victims according to the police? And maybe you could consider who do you really think is the victim here? Um, who is the power to label the homeless as deviant? That's something that Howard Becker would be very interested in. And just by looking at this article, what has your class got to do with how you encounter the law? So you can pause the lecture now. So what do the official statistics show? This is something we've discussed in class. Um, most crime is committed by the working class, according to official statistics. So how do sociologists try to explain this pattern? Um, you have already completed the blue A3 sheet that will help you answer this type of question. Um, so you might want to think, consider what Merton said in his strain theory. How did he explain why working class people commit crime? As well as the subcultural theorists like Albert Cohen, Cloward and Olin and Miller. Um, you also have Lee and Young and the left realists who d d explain why working class people commit crime. Things like marginalisation and relative deprivation. Uh, and right realist uh, James Wilson and also Kelling, when you think about uh, broken windows theory. So how do these people all try and explain why crime it seems to be committed generally by the working class? And again, use your blue worksheet to help you answer that. The other side of the argument is to question whether the official statistics are actually accurate. Um, so you might want to set, you could make an essay arguing that yes, working class people more, commit more crime. However, the other side of the argument is why do they actually appear in the statistics more than middle or upper classes? Here, you want to consider the ideas of traditional Marxists like Shambliss, uh, possibly even Lauren Schneider as well. Um, remember Shambliss, his study on the saints and the roughnecks, although it's useful for the labelling theory, it also helps to demonstrate why working class people are much more likely when they encounter the law to actually be arrested, they're more likely to be convicted. Whereas middle class people or the saints, they can use their cultural capital to talk their way out of trouble and their economic capital, such as hiring lawyers in order to keep them out of trouble. Uh, and again, this links very much so to the labelling theorists like Becker, you know, how do they end up getting labelled negatively? Who is it who has the power to do that? Braithwaite and his um, disintegrative and reintegrative shaming, shaming, Young and his deviancy amplification, and Stan Cohen, the moral panic. So you can use these sociologists to actually criticise the validity of official crime statistics. Oh, and this is just a summary of uh, some of the areas I've just mentioned to you. Oh, and it's also got the neoliberalists on there, like the Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy, and Taylor Walton and Young and their critical criminology. So, um, types of crimes that we know about. Um, official statistics dominate our knowledge about both offenders and the types of offences. As a result, we know much less about white-collar crime, state crime, occupational crime, and corporate crime than when you compare this with street crime. Why do you think this might be? So, in an essay about why working class people seem to commit more crime, you can also include a section about actually there is unreported white collar crime that's ignored. So, as a result, as a result, our stereotypes about what is criminal and what crimes are being committed are being distorted by the fact that some of these crimes in front of you now are very hard to trace, they're hard to catch, and they're definitely hard to convict. So let me go through these in a little bit more detail. You have got occupational crimes. Now these are crimes committed against an organisation by the employees. Uh, generally, this would be what we call a, a proper white-collar crime, where someone might embezzle funds from their employee, they might funnel uh, funds into their own personal accounts, they might steal from their employee, 
uh, sorry, employer, um, and make money from their job within that in, within that industry. So this is when the employees actually commit crimes against their employers. Now there is a reason why we don't actually hear much about occupational crimes, particularly amongst banks and investment banking. Uh, and this is generally because the banks themselves don't want the general public finding out that they haven't got the right controls within their industry to prevent their employees committing a crime. So generally, if, if someone does get caught committing this very complicated type of crime, the actual employer themselves will rarely report it to the police, but instead maybe deal with it in-house by firing someone and giving them a bad reference. Corporate crimes we know a little bit more about. These are crimes committed um, on behalf of an organisation. Um, you've got the example of Foxconn in China, who makes all of Apple's products. Uh, you can look at the example from uh, the Erin Brockovich movie, uh, and the company she was challenging was Pacific Gas and Electric Company. That's a fantastic movie, based on life events, and is a very good example of corporate crime. Um, against a very deprived neighbourhood. And obviously you've got Bhopal in India that we know quite a lot about. One that we haven't touched on much is state crime. Um, and Marxists in particular are interested in, in, in this. Uh, these are crimes committed by the state or its agents. So for example, the police, the army, the secret service, all sorts. And examples here can include torture, war crimes, genocide, uh, state sponsorship of terrorism, that should be, and bribery or corruption by governments themselves. Um, you may well think that this is something that only uh, developing countries uh, where the, the state might commit these sorts of crimes. But as we're going to look at, there are plenty of examples where maybe our government and especially the American government have been involved in a range of these sorts of crimes. Uh, there is an article on white collar crime that we'll be looking at in lesson. This is an extract from one of the articles. Can you have a quick read through it? And can you identify which of those three types of crime, occupational, corporate or state crime, is this? Okay. And um, what types of people are best placed to commit this type of fraud? So I want you to consider their class and their gender and their ethnicity. And do you think this type of crime gets reported to the police? And what impact will that have on our stereotypes about crime? Um, so state crime. Um, a good example is the Holocaust in 1930s Germany. Um, not only was that a state crime, but that's been a, a very widely criticised state crime. I mean, you know, it would be very hard-pressed to find someone who didn't uh, find the Holocaust absolutely horrifying. And the people who are responsible for the Holocaust, many of them have been held to account. They've been, they've been put on trial. Um, however, when you look a bit closer to home, um, particularly the behaviour of the British Army in Ireland uh, during uh, when the British Army had to occupy Northern Ireland to prevent uh, the sort of the wave of violence uh, that was there because of the differences between the Unionists and the IRA in particular, there is a movie that we'll, we'll look at in, in class um, entitled Bloody Sunday, where a peaceful protest on a Sunday in 1972 was actually fired upon by the British Army and many innocent civilians were hurt and a number of them were killed as well. Um, no one has ever stood trial for that and no one has ever uh, been arrested for that. And arguably it links to this idea that it was a, an act uh, against uh, civilians but by the agents of the state and because our state controls the judiciary and uh, the police if they don't want there to be a case to be answered for, therefore there is no case. So no one's ever been held to account for that killing on Bloody Sunday in 1972. Um, another case uh, a bit further away, Latin America, is Pinochet in Chile, very much responsible for the disappearance of hundreds of thousands of his people, no trial, torture, uh, and again we'll look at this clip in class. Uh, you could look at the structural workings of apartheid in South Africa, as a good example, uh, where the structure of the state discriminated wholly against the black community. They didn't have equal pay. They lived in shanty towns. Um, they didn't get treated the same by the, the um, police force or the judiciary. And when apartheid came to, the, to an end, when Nelson Mandela was elected, 
they never pressed charges against anyone responsible for apartheid. It was something that happened, but because the state did it, there doesn't seem to be any criminal responsibility. Uh, a much more recent case was Syria's use of chemical weapons on civilians in August 2013. This has been documented and, and uh, confirmed by the United Nations, and that was against its own civilians. And arguably, America's war on terror has been something of a state crime. When you look at the number of civilians killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, it, it is tens uh, or hundreds of times more than the number of US soldiers and British soldiers that have been killed. And looking at our government, uh, there was a case against Tony Blair and the dodgy dossier that convinced our parliament to vote for war in Iraq, when actually it turns out that dossier was almost a, a work of fantasy. Iraq did not have nuclear capabilities. They did not have uh, the, the missile capability to fire on Great Britain. Um, and in fact, Iraq was very much open to UN nuclear inspections. Um, it, it complied to a wide range of demands by the United Nations. And that's why the UN never supported us going to war in Iraq. It was America and Britain who wanted to go to war in Iraq. Some would link it to possibly um, oil revenue, and Marx is probably quite interested in that. Uh, finally, when we consider torture, um, it's worth mentioning that the Supreme Court in America does not define waterboarding as torture. If you're not sure what waterboarding is, um, you can Google it, you can, you, you can see an example of it, um, or just uh, look at some of the images, but it's effectively, it gives you the sense of being drowned, um, it can, to an extent, suffocate you, um, and it's extremely terrifying, particularly if you're someone being waterboarded who doesn't have the information to hand the people want. So how are these different types of crimes dealt with? Well, one feature of white-collar crime is that they're treated very differently by the criminal justice system when compared to street crime. Hughes and Langen say it's due to four factors, and we have touched on these before. Low visibility... Uh, generally, what crime does the media focus on? Well, generally it's street crime because it's newsworthy, it's interesting and generally quite exciting. Um, White-collar crimes are very complex and quite difficult to catch, let alone uh, convict. You've also got diffusion of responsibility. So who was responsible for us going to war? Was it Tony Blair? Was it MI6? Was it CIA? Um, but even within corporations, you've got uh, BP's oil spillage. No one went to jail for that. They have been fined. But you, they, you, they haven't sent the entire corporate board of BP to jail for the, for the oil spillage. Instead, they've used sort of economic sanctions to punish them for it. But because there's a diffusion of responsibility, there's no one individual who they can pin the blame on, even though 11 people were also killed in that oil spillage. Uh, finally, you've got diffusion of victimisation. Um, if people uh, aren't aware that they're victims of a crime, like tax avoidance or tax evasion, it's really difficult to get them reported to the police. If you've got so many victims, and maybe everyone's been affected just slightly, but a, a vast number of people, it is quite difficult to identify the fact that there's a crime taking place. So what happens to these types of crimes, and why might they not even get reported to the police? Now, at this point, I'd like you to consider an AO2 point, an evaluation point. Does our media only focus on street crime these days, or are we seeing more white-collar crime being recorded by our media? Are we seeing um, like the heads of corporations being grilled by um, select committees about their tax evasions and tax avoidance? And see if you can find an example of that. So another one good example is the expenses scandal. Okay, our media actually were responsible for detecting the fact that our MPs were charging expenses uh, for all kinds of things. Like I think a good example was a toilet roll holder, um, a duck house, a Mars bar. And uh, we, the people, at the buy through and paying tax are paying for all these things. And here's some of the sentences that were dished out to these fraudulent MPs. What I'd like you to do is have a look at these offences, uh, and particularly the, the severity of them. Some of them, this guy, for example, uh, Elliot Morley, um, £32,000. 32, 
Uh, but when you actually look at his sentence, yes, he was jailed for 16 months, but he only actually served a quarter of his term, which is four months. So this is someone who's probably quite posh, who has been uh, convicted. So in terms of uh, law enforcement, it has been enforced against him. But when you look at the severity of the sentencing, um, you can see there's a huge discrepancy between the number, of, the amount of money he basically got away with almost stealing and the amount of time he spent in jail. Um, people who cheat on benefits, I very much doubt, would get out that quickly. Another example, David Chater, £18,000, jailed for 18 months, uh, only served a third of his sentence. And Lord Taylor of Warwick, um, claiming £11,000, um, <clears throat> but was released after three months under the home detention curfew, so under house arrest. So I do want you to consider, yeah, great, these guys have been pulled up, our media is maybe highlighting white-collar crime much more, but what sort of punishments are they being uh, given? Are they being given the, the accurate punishments in, in relation to the crimes they're committing or not? Um, we've also had lots more tax evasion in the headlines. You, Barclays has been in the news very recently. Uh, Vodafone is another one. It's Gary Barlow down on the right-hand side. And... I'm sure I've shown you the clip with Amazon, Starbucks and Google being grilled by Margaret Hodge and the Select Committee. What's interesting, again, about all of these organisations is not one of them, including Gary Barlow, has got been given a criminal record for what they've done. All they've been done, uh, well, Gary Barlow has anyway, has been asked to pay back the money and that is it. So what are the effects of white collar crime? Uh, again, you can see your notes in traditional Marxist uh, approach. So Lawrence Snyder argues that the losses from corporate crime are 20 times greater than the losses due to street crime. Okay, and that's probably in terms of financial impact. Yet the chances of prosecution and penalties are very small. Uh, and William Shambliss quite famously said that power is the key factor. The courts and the jails are filled with the poor and the powerless, while organised crime is operated by the economic and political elite, and they don't generally go to jail or appear in the statistics. So therefore, white-collar crime can have serious effects for the individual, injury and death, etc., but minor consequences. Um, so there's an example of a show that I'm going to hopefully try and get the clip to work for in class just below there. Uh, but on the back of this um, handout that you've got, there is the Pinto disaster article. I'd like to have a quick read of that article, um, particularly the sort of the calculation that the, the car manufacturer made when thinking whether they should improve the car or just pay for the, all the damages from the accidents. It's quite cold and quite calculating when you weigh up actually the cost to human life and injury that was as a result of the Pinto disaster. <laughs> Um, it is worth mentioning that between 2009 and 10, there were 619 murders in Great Britain, and we're well aware of this because of the way the media reports on murder. However, official figures indicate that 500 people died in work related to their job. Uh, 1,000 people in the same time period died while driving as part of their job. And tens of thousands of people die every year as a result of ill health linked to work. But these sorts, these aren't considered murders, they're not considered um, manslaughters even. These are considered, you know, deaths as a result of individuals as opposed to something to do with the company they work for. So how is white collar crime explained? Can you make some notes on how strain theory can explain about it? How can subcultural theory explain white collar crime? And how does Marxist theory explain white collar crime? It is worth um, taking a step back and thinking about the complete hypocrisy that exists in our judicial system when it comes to white-collar crime. And uh, this is a, a quote from a bank robber. Others defrauding the government of hundreds of thousands of dollars merely get a letter from a committee asking them to come in and talk it over. Maybe it's justice, but it's a bit puzzling to a guy like me. Okay, so what does this suggest now, particularly what aspects of um, traditional Marxism could you link in here? Finally, from a methodological point of view, it is worth considering why it's so difficult to study corporate crime. Well, you've got to start off thinking what methods are actually possible. Could you do an ethnographic study? Could you immerse yourself in the culture and observe all aspects of the corporate environment? 
Um, and you've got to think about the practical problems of trying to immerse yourself, particularly in investment banking, where a certain level of qualifications is required. Um, if you conducted interviews and questionnaires, you'd obviously have to be quite open about the fact that you're doing research. Now, what would be the problem with the responses you might get to some of your questions on corporate crime? Um, perhaps, actually, the most useful source of data on corporate crime, and the police do find this is secondary data, it's business records, it's accounts, it's emails even. Um, however, what's the limitation in getting hold of all this data? Because who does it really belong to? Uh, and perhaps you could even look at uh, secondary data in terms of diaries of employers and employees. A lot of people actually keep diaries anymore, who knows? Perhaps a more interesting uh, route of study would maybe be things like their social media pages and what have you. All of this snowballs into the same effect. We know less about corporate crime than street crime. So what impact does this have on perception? Well, clearly the perception is that we have far higher levels of street crime than white-collar crime, despite the fact that the reality is very, very significantly different to what the official statistics are telling us. So when evaluating observations, interviews, questionnaires, secondary data and diaries, please apply the pervert analysis, because this is a part of the course we're going to start returning to quite soon. Okay, thank you very much, Year 13.